It is Wednesday, my dudes. <laughs> ah! Oh, he's out. Do it, Macho Man. <laughs> oh yeah! I think we're just gonna keep that. Uh, Why not? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we could maybe like uh, <laughs> snip, 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 snip that part. <laughs> But this is another installment of uh, Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Drake. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- this week we're going to be talking to uh, to Steve Scrooge. Uh, you know, he was a uh, storyboard artist on basically The Matrix, Cloud Atlas, Jupiter Ascending. He did uh, We Stand on Guard with uh, with uh, Brian K. Vaughn, and he's uh, he's pulling double duty on his new series Maestros, which is uh, you know both as writer and artist. Uh, and that's out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, October. Why wouldn't you pull faster, you fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> Leave it. <laughs> Let the boy watch. <laughs> <laughs> Do I just start from the top? No, nah, just start from, and that's out on. That's out on uh, Wednesday, October 18th. But you know what? Let's let Steve talk about it. And joining us this week, we have Steve Scrooge. He is the uh, creator behind the New Image comic series Maestros, out in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, October 18th, and on Comixology if you're more uh, digitally inclined. He is also the uh, co-creator and artist behind We Stand on Guard with Brian K. Vaughn, basically a red, white, and blue dawn. Um, he's also been, you know, he's done comic work with, with Marvel. He's done uh, storyboards for basically everything I feel like the Wachowskis have put on the big screen in the last 15 years, if not 20 years at this point. Good God. Yeah. Um, Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. Glad to be here. So, um, Maestro's is kind of this really psychedelic, you know, millennial thrust into this role that he was never really, that he never really wanted to, to do. In fact, that he kind of ran away from. Where did this, the idea for all these kind of, like, fantastic and, and, you know, mystical ideas come from? Hmm. Where do ideas come from? I'm never good at answering that question. I think, um, you know, anything I make is kind of a result of my, the media diet I've been on, the narrative media diet I've been on since I was pretty much a little kid and it all just kind of got squeezed through, you know, the lower intestine and out came maestros. (laughs) And uh, that is that's a terrible <laughs> analogy, but um, or metaphor, but there you go. But yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of fantasy. But, you know, I came into fantasy later. I probably didn't start reading a fantasy or even novels until I was like, you know, 20. And so I didn't have the same reverence for Lord of the Rings, although I, I really love Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. I kind of fell into more esoteric stuff and... Um, I think a lot of that, um, you know, uh, is what, you know, uh, is a part of the maestro's DNA. Well, and in this story, I mean, this is you kind know, of, um, yeah. This old sci-fi guy, uh, sci-fi fantasy writer by the name of uh, Jack Vance mm. had a uh, version of Wizards. He did this book called, um, uh, what is it, the, the Dying Earth, and then he wrote a bunch of crazy books as the overworld and um that was kind of an influence on on his, for his wizards were were petty they were always kind of involved in one-upsmanship with each other they were always creating weird um creatures from goo they were vain you know they're narcissistic and that kind of um you know was an inspiration kind of led me to start thinking about um you know mythology and uh you know the pettiness of like let's say the greek gods and um you know that kind of fed into where the maestros were going and what they were like and uh my perspective on them well they are kind of certainly at the start of the story from what we see very self-involved before i mean if the maestros are the Greek gods. Then, at the you really do open up this issue, really this entire series with a bang. Like Olympus has fallen, like everyone's getting massacred left, right, and center. Um, you know, you've got 
you really do hit the ground running. It's it's it really catches the reader for, from jump. So is that kind of that sense of urgency going to kind of carry throughout that entire first arc? Yeah, for sure. I guess the basic basically the maestro is the wizard king of the infinite realms, which is like this myriad of of magical lands, you know, that pretty much, you know, could be every fantasy book you've ever read. And so I wanted to create a wizard who was like the the god of all wizards, the king of wizards. And I figured at the very top of that heap, he would be, you know, essentially, you know, God. He creates worlds and destroys them for his own, you know, pleasure in the regard of his friends and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, allies or whatever. And, um, yeah, I wanted him to be, you know, he's kind of a, a bastard. I think when you get to a certain point where if you have magic and control over the forces of creation, I don't think you would you know, be fighting over resources. I mean, ultimately, all your conflict would spring out of your ego, you know? And uh, that's kind of where he's at. He's um, he does he, he's villainous, but in no way does he see himself as a, as a villain. He's just, um, he's just, you know, he's a massive ego. The universe, he, the universe exists with him at its center, you know? Mm-hmm. Everything revolves around him. How far does the uh, apple fall? So what happens is he ultimately gets a lot of enemies, and an ancient enemy returns, and him and his entire royal family, which you know he has like two hundred wives, twice as many children, uh, and they all get murdered uh, by this ancient enemy called Marduk, and um, the throne goes to his banished human son from Earth, who's kind of just a regular contemporary guy. Uh, who, you know, um, whose mother hooked up with the maestro and, uh, you know, he, uh, he didn't enjoy his, his time in the wizarding world. You know, he's like a regular guy from Orlando, Florida. And now he's, you know, mixing it up with, um, all amazing fantasy beings. And he's, you know, expecting Hogwarts and Harry Potter. And what he finds out is, uh, he, not so much It's survival of the fittest, um, you have to prove yourself worthy of the maestro's blood and being uh, the prince of uh, being a prince of, you know, all these couple hundred princes does not um, uh, you know, exempt from punishment or, uh, you know, the cruelty of your peers and masters. And uh, yeah, so he, he kind of loses his, um, the the he's not as enchanted with this magical world after he goes there, and so he kind of has an axe to grind when he when he returns as the as the new wizard king, because now he can kind of you know force feed this uh, so, social justice uh, shit sandwich down all these uh, <laughs> mad mages throats you know and uh, and so in a way you know he has to kind of. Uh, see if he can still be a nice guy when he has basically ultimate power. With uh, with Willie, the uh, the young man that that is the maestro's son, that suddenly becomes you know thrust into this position. He's the new he is the new maestro. Yeah. Is his mother going to do her best to keep him keep him in check, or kind of remind him of his connection to humanity, or will she have other other things to to kind of handle in the in the interim? Well, she's there, and then you meet his love interest, who was basically his only friend at a wizard school, um, uh, this girl named Ren. And, yeah, they're constantly giving him support, but, you know, everyone's kind of new to this role. Um, and, yeah, we definitely have scenes where he likes, they just, you know, are you sure you're okay with this? You seem to be, this seems to be changing you a little bit, because he, he sort of uh, enforces all these uh you know, protocols onto wizards and stuff. You're no longer allowed to like create life whenever you want. You've got to uh, provide, you know, all sorts of uh, support services to your, you know, um, underlings and the slavery is outlawed and, and everything else. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a new experience for everybody. One of the things, and I I had mentioned this in the, in the magazine, but for anyone who, who didn't pick up uh, image plus, um, and you totally should, but the, uh, that was the uh, I think that was the last issue of the of the previous volume now that I think about it issue uh 14 but um one of the things I really dug about this opening about this opening arc 
Willie's mom has a sword that apparently has like a soul trapped into it, and that sword is really not having a good time. What was kind of the inspiration and the bigger story behind that? Well, the inspiration, if you go back, like souls being entrapped in things is kind of a uh, well-worn fantasy trope. You know, Elric, you know, had uh, the sword Stormbringer, and if he killed you with that sword, uh, you, your soul would be swallowed, you would be absorbed into it, and you'd be pr- in prison there forever. So it's sort of that. It's a little bit, you know, you always see in uh, Beauty and the Beast, you know, you see all these teapots and whatever that are sentient and are ha- ha- hopping around and, like, everyone's having a great time. But it kind of always felt to me that it would be rather shitty to be stuck as a teapot. And uh, so one of the maestros, that we're talking about his father, the old wizard king who was murdered, one of his favorite things to do is to take his many, many em- enemies and imprison them in different objects. Uh, loyal backstabber, uh, the sword you're mentioning, um, he was, uh, he's now a, a forgotten noble king who somehow crossed the maestro. Maybe we don't know what, what he ever did. Maybe he just refused to command or didn't laugh at one of his jokes or something like that. But as punishment, he, he was forced, his soul was forced into his own blade, uh, where it's, it's stayed ever since. And uh, later in the story, you get to visit the uh, Hall of uh, Conquest and Torment, where its endless walls are lined with uh, all sorts of objects with uh, tortured souls inside them. That sounds metal as hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The um, you you had mentioned the maestro, the Willie's dad being very vindictive, and and Willie himself being kind of vindictive when he gets back is, is a lot of this opening arc kind of going to be, you know, the sins of the father or, or the apple not falling too far from the tree. Well, mostly what happens is he comes back and he makes everyone else kind of eat shit. And that kind of backfires on him because then his most, his number one, uh, magical item in his arsenal is this thing called the book of remaking. And basically, uh, if you open this book, the user can recreate reality with themselves at the center, essentially making you God. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's immediately stolen. And then he's kind of on the run. The, the trick is that only you need the blood of, of the Khazar. You need, uh, the maestro's real name is Mitra Khazar. And, um, you need to be a blood relative to open the book. And so it gets stolen, but the thieves soon realize that uh, it's useless unless they get him to open it for them. And so he's kind of on the run um, by this uh, this team of the um, his father's, you know, kind of uh, you know second in command on his high council has betrayed him and uh, teamed up with this ancient wizard who was the uh, maestro's um, greatest enemy. And they're after this uh, this book. So it's this both, ultimate spell, right? So it's both a kind of a coming of age and uh, and you know all sorts of like court intrigue and within the multiverse and that sort of thing. Well, a little, a little bit. It's kind of an, an author run. Like the second issue is that you you know the the first issue he finds out he sort of uh, an attempt on his life is foiled, and the second issue it's him on the throne. Um, you know, he's he's loving it. He's forcing all these, um, you know, power mad mages into, uh, you know, doing, you know, uh, all these rules, all these kind of, you know, social justice rules that he learned while auditing, uh, you know, uh, his local community college while banished. And so he's making them learn all these things. And um, and then it kind of yeah it backfires his um the book is is stolen, and, and then now he's sort of on the run, and he can't be caught, or else, you know, both him and his uh, mother and, and girlfriend can't uh, can't get caught, or else they could be used against him to force him to open this book. So he has to go find allies, and then later in the series, he goes and tries to get help from uh, one of the Maestro's other great enemies, who is uh, the Demon King of the Underworld. And that's probably in issue five right on, that right happens. On. You know, you had yeah. you had started out penciling with Marvel, you know, Spider Man and all all that sort of thing, and then of course, very successful uh, career doing storyboards for the Matrix trilogy, Cloud Atlas, Jupiter Ascending, and you look at a lot of those storyboards, and a lot of them 
um, a lot of them kind of look like comic book panels. What what do you think it is about you know having worked in both mediums, uh, both cinema and and comics, that that keeps bringing you back to comics? What kind of what's the appeal there? Well, in movies, I mean, movies are great. I mean, it's a great job. You know, um, I've had a lot of great experiences working in film. Yeah, mo- you know, most of them have been great, and um, it can be a lot of fun. It's cool to collaborate with other people and stuff, but. Um, you know, I'm a comic book nerd from way back, and the dream was always to do your own book, you know. And, um, you know, on a movie, you're one of many helping hands. You know, you'll work, and, yeah, you maybe a shot will show up here or there, or you'll come up with an idea that will evil, help evolve that action scene or something else. But it was really – but sometimes it's not really about the drawing. You know, it's more about, you know, you're one uh, – you're helping to make a blueprint for something else. That's kind of what storyboard, storyboards are. Which is great, um, but you know, if you're a comic book fan, you know you want you want to take your time and be precious about your drawings. You want to have a. It's great to have a story to be drawing a story that has like you know it's got some comedy in it. There's some you know emotional moments and stuff. There's romance. There's all these other things you get to draw. You get to draw characters acting and stuff, and so it's a bit more fulfilling, you know, than uh, than I think film work is, uh, at least for me. So uh, that, that that's kind of why I had to come back and, and, and do it. And yeah, there's a, we, we've been very lucky to talk to a lot of comic creators that, that handle both the art and the, the scripting duties. Jake, one of the uh, co-hosts here always kind of refers to it as, um, Barry Windsor smithing it after the weapon X, uh, story. Right. Um, or, uh, mm-hmm. I guess Walt Simonson did the same thing with Thor. Um, Frank Miller with Daredevil. Lots of guys. Frank Miller, Mike Mignola. Mm-hmm. Who were you some know. of who were some of your big uh, influences like that that you know either just as a fan or or you know when you started picking up the pencil yourself? Um, big influences like going back to the day you know, you know John it was you know John Byrne and especially Michael Golden from those early formative years reading the the 80s Marvel comics. Uh, and then later on yeah and then like Frank but just like everybody Frank Miller, The Watchmen, kind of all the classic comics that came out of the 80s that, that we all love and uh, they're making so many movies into, out of now. And then I went further along and then, you know, you discover, I discovered Jeff Darrow and Mobius and uh, Otomo, you know, Akira is a huge influence on me and, um, you know, this is French artist Frank, Francois Bouc, his work I really I enjoy. And yeah, that's like, I feel like I'm being influenced by so many people all the time, you know. Even the stuff you don't really draw like is kind of an influence in a way, you know. It it sort of helps, you know. Like James Heron is a guy whose work I really love. I don't draw anything like him, but I love what he does. So, one of the things I do kind of find so, yeah. that that sets this book and and your storytelling style, there is kind of this like prodigious like dark sense of humor that runs through Maestro's. I mean. You know, mild, very mild spoilers, but I mean, there's a sequence with a, a I suppose Texas oil man that meets that cuts a deal with <laughs> Willie, that <laughs> cuts a deal with Willie, and then given what happens yeah. to him, <laughs> but um, oh yeah, there's a well, lot. That's kind of getting to see. There's something about the Texas oil man and the petty god that kind of share something. You know, like there's both some. There's something small about about people who have a lot of power and privilege and influence who are complete assholes, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like power kind of does that to you. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what that scene is about. It's, it's a funny scene. I also, it takes place in a sub and uh, I kind of wanted to start a fantasy story in a place where, you know, that you, you would never start a fantasy epic there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, definitely it's played for laughs, but I think it kind of fits into the theme as well. Sure, yeah. And just but it's of... a bit nuts. It's a uh, lot of people have been commenting about it like, oh, this this book is full of sex. I'm like, there's really only two panels, there's one panel of sex and there's one panel of male full frontal nudity. And that's kind of it for the whole series. <laughs> but I've been like uh, painted. I think I'm being painted as a, a smut, smut maker or something. <laughs> uh, I'm I a pornographer now. I believe it's smut peddler. <laughs> smut peddler? Yeah. I, I'm still learning the nomenclature uh, new to the smut business. I mean, it certainly got our attention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thumbs up. Well, shit, you know, that's what's so awesome about Image. I mean, you will never see a scene like that in Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
like at least not for five more years. We'll wait till a movie does it. Yeah. Did you uh, did you dig um, Logan? Oh, I loved Logan. I Logan was the movie. Like it's so funny. It's like eleven movies he was in as Logan, and like finally he <laughs> stuck. You know, they stuck the landing and got a perfect hand. I really, I really dug that movie. Yeah. Um, the tone, I just. Because, uh, you know, Wolverine was the last thing I did at Marvel, and I've always loved the character, and, um, yeah, I just I just thought they did, I just love the way they kind of, like, scraped away the dignity of those two, and uh, those characters, and Professor X, and, um, yeah, it made me weepy at the end, and how about you guys? I, I love the movie up until Clone Wolverine shows up. I would have. Rather... I hear a lot of people complain about that. Yeah, they don't. People don't like that. You know, I even though it's a movie full of, well, I guess just with a clone already. I guess yeah. that's the central one of the central narrative elements. You know, it just and you could argue, yeah, it's Logan fighting his dark, his literal dark half, his literal savage side. It, it's something felt a little. I I liked the Reavers just fine. I liked the dude with the metal hand just fine. You yeah. know. Um, it kind of loses that a bit for me. If it was Sabretooth, I'd be all about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the, what I hear. The comic fan always says that, but I can't. Has he ever fought his clone before? No, it doesn't nothing jumps out to me. That's what I kind of liked about it. I mean, the movie should be a lot to do with the comics do and like break new ground. You know, mm-hmm. like it's definitely leans on Mark Miller's, um, uh, you know. Um, Old Man Logan. Uh, old Man Logan. But, you know, it kind of goes, does its own thing, too. And uh, I kind of like liked Young Wolverine. Mm. Um, kind of the ghost of his past. I like, just like that idea of, like, the, the whole, like, exploitation of, of mutant abilities and stuff. And uh, I, I, I like that there's that part of it that they're, they just want to be, they're a resource to be exploited. Mm. Um, I thought it was cool. But I get it. I know a lot of people. Everyone, you know, I've got so many strong feelings. You should, I was very depressed after Superman versus Batman. So, oh yeah, oh that yeah, was a yeah. disaster. <laughs> Who yeah. was it though? Yeah, that was just uh, something yeah. else. Suicide Squad as well. Oh yeah, I don't know if you saw that. Suicide Squad was just a shitty movie, but they didn't take <laughs> Aunt May and turn it into like some kind of German porno. You know what I mean? Like where they're like writing Sharpie on her forehead and stuff. I'm like, this is. Little kids are seeing this. <laughs> yeah, it was like authentically disturbed. Yeah, I still think. But, uh, yeah, yeah, Suicide Squad wasn't very good. I still think my favorite superhero movie of the year is Lego Batman. Like I thought that just the Lego Batman movie totally just did everything I wanted a superhero movie to mm. do. Um, I haven't seen it yet. But Lo- Logan, though, it was funny because we saw that we were in what Seattle, well, Emerald City, Emerald Com- City, Com- yeah. yeah, Emerald City Comic Con, yeah, with Rob Liefeld in the theater for some reason. Yeah, that was surreal <laughs> having Rob Liefeld like sit behind <laughs> us and they had the. Did he talk during the movie? No, no, uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did that. <laughs> um, no, well, they they had the uh, the Deadpool two trailer before, so it was kind of surreal. I was like, oh, that's crazy. He's sitting right behind us, but um, uh. I remember, like, I was so into the movie because uh, some, I think Patton Oswald said it was like Sam Peckinpah directing a superhero movie. And so that yeah, got totally. me super excited. I mean, I, I really, the, the, the um, young uh, clone X24, I guess, right? They, they would have called it the, the X. Yeah, because the girl's X23. X23 yeah. yeah, so X24, Logan. Like, that threw me off for the first time. And I was kind of like, ah, I don't know. And then, you know, but I saw it a second time um, with my dad, who, like, like he's. Now it's funny, like, he'll go see movies, like, he's really into superhero stuff, but, like, four or five years ago, that would have never happened. But, you know, he, you know, uh-huh. I have a sister yet, you know, his, his daughter and stuff, so he got, like, super weepy at the end, which was kind of awkward, but I knew it was going to happen. But, like, I knew that the young Logan was coming the second time, and it really didn't bother me too much. And also, like, the the, the I think that whole scene, looking back at it, like, this family inviting Logan in, and all of them being slaughtered, oh. like, horribly, like, that kind of really works like in a perfect way of showing like how just tragic Wolverine's life is. And that turn, the, the, the great, I think the payoff of that whole scene 
is like you get them hanging out with the the dad, right? And he like shoes off the guys, you know, he calls him dickhead, which is funny. And like he's like get the fuck out of here. Right. And then they come back and like his entire family is slaughtered and he tries to kill Wolverine and has no shells left. Mm. And like how quick that yeah. that friendship ended and how horrible Wolverine just destroyed this guy's life was I thought one of the most like Yeah, just follows him everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that, I thought that was nothing worked but really horror well. and gore for him. Yeah. And he's just tried to do the right thing. Yeah. Which is cool because you kind of see like you get why he's that guy he is at the beginning of the of the movie. He's like, stay out of my shit, you know. <laughs> he's gonna like leave Caliban behind. Yeah. He's just like not. He's he's not the very you know. He he's just become you know a narcissist of his own in his own grief. Yeah. You know, he just cares about him himself at that point. See, yeah. Which I liked because it was like you know, like in a way, I feel like the comics would never go there. You like, there's always that p- moment in, in like the corporate characters where they stop and they go, "This is what it means to be a hero," you know. <laughs> and they got their hands on their hip, and a hero would, you know. And Wolverine's done plenty of speeches like that that I've heard over the years, and I kind of like at the end, like, yeah, it's not that easy, you know. Yeah. You well, know, it's like I love how he said, you know, like there was like a week or something that like the X-Men really happened. And then it kind of like ended, it was like Woodstock or something, mm. you know? And then the mythology grew out of that. Mm, yeah. I thought that was, uh, was really cool. The kind of, and, uh, yeah. I did kind of like that, uh, that other Wolverine, the clone, cause it's such a violation. Like here's, here's everything that's strong about you physically with your humanity stripped away. Mm-hmm. It's like his worst nightmare, you know? Yeah. It's cause remember in the comics, he was always worried about that. He was going to become like a, a psycho, mm. like in the early days. That's what it was like, you know? Yeah. Like now, there he was confronted with it. His dark, his literal dark half. Yeah, totally. And you also totally. got to see you get the, the cool thing about I guess him was like you got to just fuck him up as much <laughs> as you wanted, like and and like oh yeah, and like that shot of him just getting like buckshot in the face and is like you know and and the beginning was just I remember the whole theater like everyone knew the movie was R going into it, but that whole opening shot of him like trying to protect his limo and they like you know I guess they shoot it or whatever and he finally pops his claws and one's like not coming out right and then he just starts lopping limbs oh, off oh yeah and I remember I was like oh fuck yeah. <laughs> that was I was getting yeah, I like I love that uh, I love yeah. it when he goes down and they start killing him and, he, and then he finally goes berserk yeah. after 11 fucking movies <laughs> Wolverine does what he does like on every other page of the comic that was just so awesome you know Steve yeah that, it was cool th- this leads me to the question that we ask everybody that comes on the show what are you currently geeking out over well, I'm geeking out, you know, we just, I got a nine month old and we got another one on the way, so I don't get to geek out on much. <laughs> and what I have to recommend doesn't need a recommend, recommendation from me, but Rick and Morty <laughs> is basically my life, my media diet now is just Rick and Morty and Game of Thrones. Mm. But I got to tell you, I think I like Rick and Morty way better than Game of Thrones. I think it's, <laughs> uh, I don't know, do you guys watch that show? Do you like it? Rick and oh. Morty is wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rick and Morty it's so smart. Yeah, I you know I, do I don't think I've liked anything as much as Rick and Morty like since the I was a kid and he, like I've rewatched every episode. I mean it's been it's kind of mental. I've never liked or been into something. I can't. I don't even really know what it is. There's something about something about it that I just really love. I guess it's kind of about yeah assholes and gods too, right? Like that's kind of what Rick is. Sure. And, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm obsessed with that. And, um, what have I seen lately? Um, I've seen, I feel like I've got a good recommendation in me. <laughs> you were mentioning Game of Thrones. What did you think of the latest season? I like it. You know, there, you know, there's plenty to pick on. You know, I, I've gotten to this point in my life where I've just decided I'm not a very good critic. I don't want to be a critic. I'm a, I'll leave the criticizing to other people. I just kind of like, Love the stuff I like, and I I dig it. When they brought out that uh, spoiler alert, uh, the uh, resurrected the dragon, I was like, damn. And then I figured it out. <laughs> she has three dragons, one to die, and then one for Daenerys and one for Jon Snow to, to fly around on. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's next season. Yeah. And especially since it's been established that like the dragons are friendly with Jon, too. Yeah, he has like the nice little. Yeah, the did you see nose. that thing where it was like the moment in um, the guys who made that scene? Like it's cut exactly like the moment where the the kid from uh, How to Train Your Dragon meets his dragon. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not. It's the exact same as the scene. Sorry, I said that. It's exact same as the scene from um, 
uh, when Donkey meets the dragon in Shrek. Oh, really? Like it's all the sa- it's all the same shots. It's really funny. That's interesting. <laughs> that's the love interest for season eight, Shrek. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what Donkey, <laughs> Donkey, and Donkey and the dragon have like. Oh, yeah. whatever those things are. Yeah. Yeah, those <laughs> yeah, horrible, exactly. horrible. I, I'm just looking forward to the mountain versus the hound. That's the thing I'm looking forward to most in, in season eight. Cause, like, they oh, te- you know that's going to happen. They tease that. Like he, I, I remember he like walks up, and he's like, what the fuck did they do to you? And then he walks out, and I was like, oh, god damn. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. I forgot those two guys had even met. You know, it had yeah. been so long. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think Brienne's going to come in and be like, those two badasses against uh, the mountain. I think it's got to be that. I, I'm hoping for like this super sappy thing where like the the hound. It's because you know they're both probably gonna die. Like it like they're both just gonna kill each other. But it's gonna be like who dies first kind of thing. Because mm. like they're just you know the kind of these tragic, like Logan and, and evil Logan. Like, oh, yeah, exactly. And then like X twenty three Arya's. I think Arya's gonna see it and gonna, she's gonna provide like the final like oomph for the hound because you know that, mm. that the hound and Arya's thing is not done yet either and and there that moment with brienne and the hound was was really touching where the hound is kind of like you think you think the hound's gonna bite it huh i think oh, i don't want him to because he's like my favorite character but i think he's i think when he and the him and the mountain fight it's gonna end with he's gonna kill that hopefully kill the mountain but it's game of thrones so he might just the mountain might kill him in like five seconds just to fuck everyone's you know minds but I think I'm hoping it, you know the hound goes out in a blaze of glory against against the mountain and has like one final moment with Arya because they kind of been setting up the whole thing where she trains with the god of many faces like really subtle things where she you know leaves the hound to die and he's like why did she do that and she's like because I hated him and he smacks her and she's like you know you're lying and like just little things like that so like, you know they're not, they're you know they're gonna have to at least meet one more time and hopefully it's like you know in the crescendo mm. of that that'd be cool. Yeah, I'm not sure how it's all going to land because you, the the show has like sets up the way they do it is if you have a, a noble beloved character they get messed up, mm-hmm. right? Like in a normal fantasy story where that character would be safe, they should generally be killed in Game of Thrones. Yeah. But final season, I don't know. Probably don't know. Like, was Jon Snow going to die? Daenerys. I would. Those? I been? would bet Daenerys. Probably John will probably make it, but at the expense of the love of his life again if i had to make the the guess but they keep talking about i forgot i didn't even realize that she's infertile so i feel like they brought up the fact that she's infertile because she's going to get impregnated by john snow's magic seed or something because he even says like you know know, she's probably lying you know that's like like, the best come on ever right or is that the worst come on ever? (laughs) (laughs) well it's gonna be really awkward where he's like yeah he comes back in like episode eight he's like i just banged daenerys and he's like well about that (laughs) (laughs) he's like oh shit what's with with, with george martin and his love of incest (laughs) like we got cersei and now john and uh uh, Daenerys, Daenerys, they're like related. Yeah. Anti love. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's, yeah. That was just, that uh-huh. whole thing was just like, that's, that voiceover and that scene was just done so awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess was obviously the point, but still, I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Everyone, that's what the show is like getting to the point now. No, no, no fooling around. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Everything's happening. But anyway, yeah, I love that. And um, what else do I watch? I don't know. God, there hasn't been much, guys. Been pretty. Uh, Nothing in the cinema. Pretty, um, spare. Well, what did I see? I went to. You know, I saw most of the big movies this summer. Wonder Woman was was good. Um, Baby what Driver. Did Marvel have. Uh, Marvel. Oh, I ha- like Baby Driver. Yeah, and then Marvel had Guardians Two and Spider Man Homecoming. Guardians Two, I liked, but I don't know. Like, it definitely felt like, you know, a little, wasn't as fresh as the original one, but I did enjoy myself. In Spider-Man, I didn't think I would like it very much, and I think it was, it was like, the best one. I, I, th- I thought it was uh, very entertaining, and uh, I the thing I liked most about it was the corporate synergy, the way they were, the, the characters that were owned by Disney also played uh, with Star Wars, which was owned by Disney, that played with Lego versions of Star Wars, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, uh, there's some, there's... You know, there's some kind of Guinness record in there somewhere. 
Disney's buying everything, man. Oh, they have yeah. Indiana Jones yeah. too. We're gonna sp- we're supposed to get that what twenty twenty. Is it 2020 now? I, I think they pushed it. Oh, is it 2019? Okay, yeah. yeah. And they still, and it's like Harrison's not getting any younger. <laughs> yeah, Harrison. Yeah. I just thought it would have been cooler if they played with garbage pail kids or something. <laughs> you know, uh, instead of Lego. Uh, and he's a bit old to be playing with. Le- no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's still time. <laughs> um, that's like ET. Yeah. ET. Like they have Star Wars toys in it, right? Well, that's more. Yeah. Even though it's. Paramount that did E.T., but there's just the, the uh, Spielberg. Spielberg's yeah, like, Spielberg George Lucas is anything. my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I helped produce Star Wars <laughs> secretly. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, so, Steve, is there anything else you want to plug before we, uh, before we uh, sign out? That's about it. Um, please check out Maestro's if you get the chance. And, um, yeah, that, that's about it. All right. And, well, uh, yeah, that's what. well, again, that first issue is out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, October 18th. And We Stand on Guard has just recently got a paperback edition, but you can also get it in lovely hardback. And, again, it's available on imagecomics.com or on Comixology. Steve, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. You know, I, talking to Steve gave me a newfound appreciation for Logan. Yeah. Because I'd kind of written that movie, like I own it, mm-hmm. but um, is it right next to your copy of The Spirit? In my heart, Alph- <laughs> alphabetically, probably no. <laughs> what you don't you don't organize by awesomeness? <laughs> yeah, it's like there are times where I'll like be on Voodoo and see what's on sale, and I'll like hover over the founder, <laughs> and I know better. Yeah, you like tweet me like almost out of like desperation. Yeah, like please, like, I'm about to do tell it. Me, tell me. Tell me to not buy it yeah. because I can't tell myself. Yeah, it's like it's like you. That's like me looking at like a big old like hamburger or something like that. It's like ah, I've already eaten two meals <laughs> in the past half hour. I should probably put this down. Yeah. Somebody tell me to not eat another hamburger. Just, and like feeling everything tremble. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was good to have him on the show. Good, you know, talking about his talking about my estro. Was talking about you know just geeking out over film for a guy yeah. that, that really has visually defined a lot of stuff that, that I think we've all kind of looked up to. Yes, sir. But uh, you guys uh, you guys saw a film yourselves last week. Yeah. Kingsman, yes. the Golden Circle. Mm. I feel like there's a couple Golden Circles in that film. Yes. That you could talk about. Um, I've actually seen it twice, but um, because I hated it that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really love the movie a lot. I... Um, uh, you know, between seeing that in theaters basically twice and then finally like a fool waiting so long to watch Ash vs. Evil Dead, um, it's two of the most enjoyable experiences on the big screen and small screen recently I can think of. Like just total fucking joy and insanity and over the top in the best way possible. Yeah, I really loved uh, I loved Kingsman. It was very much a fun action movie. Yeah. And... Much in the same vein that the first one was a, was a fun action Yeah, I movie. mean, it's it, it kind of ramps it up a little bit. Um, I mean, it gets... Yeah, well, the first one gets the action pretty quick, but this one, I mean, goes for broke with the action. Yeah. You get a print song, which is pretty fantastic. Oh. Mm. And, like, the way it's cut together... Like, Matthew Vaughn has really... Like, the more I think about the movies I've seen of his that I like, which is most of them, off the top of my head, like, he's really becoming one of my favorite directors. Like, one of those yeah. guys, I'll go see a movie solely because it's Matthew Vaughn. Um, because I really love his style. I can't remember uh, the uh, movies outside of Kingsman that he's well, done. Well, he did the first, obviously the first two Kingsmen. He did the first Kick-Ass. Mm. He did uh, X-Men, First Class. Um, those are kind of like the big recent gotcha. ones. Um, all all good stuff in my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he obviously he's done a bunch more. Uh, I think he did Layer Cake. Yes. Um, that was his directorial debut. Yeah, that's ah. a good movie. Because he had been... I, a, he had produced the earlier Guy Ritchie. That's films. right. Yeah, I, I I keep Layer Cake is one that keeps popping up and like the kind of like, hey, you like this kind of stuff. You mm-hmm. probably like this too. And I'm like, I don't know anything about you, yeah. and I'm lazy and I don't want to do it's any got research. Daniel Craig and Sienna Miller in it. Which oh. is pretty great. Uh, no, I remember enjoying that. I remember watching that when Daniel Craig got cast as Bond because I think that was either coming out like on. DVD or something along those lines because the mm-hmm. cover is very James Bond like yes. and I think he even makes a James Bond reference to it uh, in the movie which is kind of funny because it's you know pre him being Bond mm. but anyway he has a style that Kingsman I think is kind of really become the perfect 
really because he he basically is the um film voice of Mark Miller yeah. because Mark Miller uh and David Gibbons uh you know created uh, Kingsman uh, or Secret Service the the comic book and then uh Kick Ass you know with Mark Miller and John Romita mm-hmm. Jr. um and he like I said he only did the first one I think you know probably I think produced the second one I think he also co-wrote if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, Days of Future, pa- Days of Future Past, because mm. um, he was originally set to direct that one. Yeah, and then he was like, "Oh, I want to do a Kingsman sequel." Yeah, and because this is the first sequel he's ever done, mm-hmm. and he, like I said, it just the fight style is so unique. And I know Chris, you probably really like this about him is that I know a lot of people have complained about the Jason Bourne fight style, yeah, which is really shaky and crazy, and it's amazing, but you feel like you're missing it. Yes. Mar- uh, you Matthew- have no sense yeah. of geography. Matthew Vaughn is smooth as hell. Yes, and super creative. Yes, like uh, you know, and and he wants you to see the spectacle that yes. he's creating. Yes, and the way that it cuts to and from those action set pieces okay. and, and 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 what like yeah, the beginning of this movie and the end of this movie have two of the best he's ever done, and mm-hmm. this is from the guy that did that fantastic church fight in yes. the first Kingsman, which is probably still number one. I mean, yeah. that that's yeah, no, I, I, I would still I would still put uh, the church fight. At the top, but like the um, the 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 final fight scene yes. in in Golden Circle mm-hmm. is which is long. It's like it's yeah. a long fight yeah. scene, and it's, it's it's like a three act fight scene. Yeah, and it's and it's fake one shot. Yes, and it's uh, wonderful. Like uh, as, as we remember from my talking about Atomic Blonde and the Hitman's Bodyguard. Like I love the Assassin's Bodyguard. <laughs> I, I wanted to I throw paused. that in my. In I wanted my brain, to throw I that paused. screw in the in, the wrench in the, in the gear, and just I saw it in your face. You're like, oh, I got it right. I got it right. You got it right. Son of a bitch. You got it right. <laughs> but but yeah, uh, like this has again. It doesn't. It, it doesn't come to like the realism that Atomic Blonde uh, had in the in the one take. No, but like. But it's not supposed to. No, the the Kingsman is supposed to be cartoonish mm-hmm. in its violence and action, and uh, but like and it just has, uh, f- like I said, fake one take fight scenes where they do they, these they wonderful. The camera, spin- yeah. yeah, pretty much any time the camera spins around the characters, yeah. that's either a switch to CGI or a hidden cut. Yeah, and it it not and I, and I am not trying to be like fuck that i loved it because uh-huh. it still looked really cool and you're still getting a b- beautiful sense of what the fight scene is going on like you know like you mentioned earlier you you were 100% right i hate the born style fights where it's all very tight very mm-hmm. close all you see is the fists or the kicks i love in this one you see like bodies you know two dudes three dudes you know dogs mm-hmm. uh you know all you know going at it yeah. uh, in in like wide shots and then like they do that 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 silly like tighten in for like a punch and then mm-hmm. it pulls right back out as if it's like a transitioning uh, comic book panel sure. you know where you see the 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 two shot mm-hmm. you know the two guys standing next to each other and then you see the fist coming and it and as the th- punch is being thrown it zooms in on the hand yeah you see the the fist make contact and then as the hand uh, the the hand pulls away the camera pulls back as well and like Shit like that is just beautiful, and he has that down to a T. Mm-hmm. Like he had it fine in the Secret Service, Kingsman, the Secret Service, yes. and like he's just gotten better. Yeah, he, well, because I mean, I really I think back to um, <clears throat> the first Kickass movie in the end with Hit Girl, mm-hmm. where she's clearing that room to uh, bad reputation by Joan Jett, yeah, and just slaying everybody. And she does mm-hmm. that thing again. <clears throat> I think part of the joy of of Matthew Vaughn movies are the suspension of disbelief yeah. like he is a and and there's a scene where she uh basically drops the magazines like you know reloads and then flips them in the air and then like has like basically reloads in the air you know like something that was physically impossible yeah. but because you're on this ride and it is comic book and he's a huge fan yeah of of he, the the comic book genre he sets he he manages to set the rules of the universe very early on sure yeah and the rules are that there are no rules yeah uh, <laughs> but you know what the great thing about Matthew Vaughn is yeah. as well is all the action stuff is great. Yeah. But like Mark Miller, who I l- like and love, even love, I would say I love Mark Miller Ooh. very much in terms of uh, uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, as a writer, you know, and, and his <laughs> stories. But is he has underneath the chaos, the violence, the cursing, the insanity. The he, he has the skulls, <laughs> the, the, the bodies, the, the skeleton heads. 
Yeah, yeah skeleton heads. <laughs> yeah, skulls. What the hell's a skull? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Jason probably, Misfits song. I want your skeleton head. <laughs> it's it's uh, skulls and uh, sa- uh, in sa- assassin bodyguards. Yeah, assassin's like, body. Yeah, it's best the same, friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but is the underlying heartbeat and emotion mm-hmm. to it? <clears throat> and there's a couple scenes in this that um, I don't want to spoil for people who haven't seen the movie who might be listening, but it's some really great, I think, um, callbacks. And another thing, too, is like I think a lot of movies feel the need to shove the first movie down your throat if you haven't seen it. Yeah. They're not really that concerned. Like, if, no. you, if you haven't seen the second movie, that's yeah. on you. Or the first movie, that's on you, man. Yeah. There uh, and 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 also I feel like you. Yeah, didn't, why shouldn't you? You should. Yeah, but like the way that the story is presented, I feel like you didn't need to have. You didn't need seen to, it. but it, there, there there were callbacks to it that like you're like oh I get what it gives you talking treats. About. Yeah, it gives you nice exactly. little treats. Or like you understand certain people's you know like because they don't reintroduce anyone. It, mm-hmm. it is just this person's now established in this yeah. universe. You like it or you know leave it. Yeah. Uh. So like it helps you. It helps you understand who these people are. Like I. So um. Uh, it's in the opening scene, so don't feel bad about uh, revealing it. But, uh-huh. but Charlie comes back. Yes, Charlie, who was one of the recruits yes. for the Kings for the Kings that was in the nice. first movie. I thought that was great, mm-hmm. especially. So, I I had not seen Kingsman the first, uh, the Secret Service mm-hmm. since uh, it came out. Yeah. So I, uh, I I rewatched it the day that we went to go. Yes. Um, and I'm glad I did because I probably would have been like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" Because I completely. For, I, I I forgot him based on his name, and he doesn't. And he, he looks, looks different. Yeah, he looks totally different. Now. Like at first, I thought it was the yeah. reason they showed his face and gave a little background in the very beginning was because he had changed his yeah. face. Like he looks so different. As, I almost thought it was like a different actor or something yeah. like that. May and and like I would have been like, oh, that's a cute way to hide the fact that you changed actors. Yeah, but it's like he just doesn't have like the long flowing hair, shaved yeah. head, and facial hair. It almost looks like Chris Evans. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but like they very quickly, uh, you know, re, uh, uh, you know, like just they're like Charlie, what are you? doing here yeah I and thought they, you were dead they and do then, like, a little background yeah, to it and it, yeah and it's not but it's not until like another 10 minutes after a glorious car chase scene yeah fantastic uh, that uh that they explain oh yeah charlie uh we thought he was dead yeah but because you shocked him he's alive still you yeah know? like they well they give a reasoning yeah. to it like you know you shocked the the chip in his neck that would have blown his head off like yeah. in the wonderful fireworks they did yeah. in the first movie uh instead it blows off his arm and that of, and that gave a cool reason for why he has a bionic arm yeah Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. With us. Uh, oh, I've got... I, so, <laughs> Julianne Moore, right? Yeah. Yeah. I loved her puns. Yeah, and she she is such a good actress that, like, she lets you wallow in the, yeah. like, awkwardness of it. Mm-hmm. Like, Armageddon... Like, she gives uh, Charlie the new arm and is like, I'm calling it Armageddon. And, like, it's one of those things where you the audience kind of sits there and is like, oh, God. But then she has like that Julianne Moore smile, yeah, and she just is like, "Here you go!" Like she never loses her cool. Yeah. Like she's yeah. always it's 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 like a dad joke where you just like kind of like my the jokes I make, yeah. where I'm just like, "Come on, guys, you are going to sit acknowledge here, acknowledge that you're, I made a you're, joke. You're gonna I'm not here. asking you to acknowledge that it was good. Yeah. Just be like, okay, Chris, good job, you yeah. made joke.' And the movie, <laughs> and, like, and it's not like it doesn't hit you over the head with that constantly. No, like, you know, no, but, no, she only does that like five times in the entire movie. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, and but she, it was it was glorious. I was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's it's it, you know, and, and introducing the statesman was mm-hmm. really yeah. exciting. I will say, biggest upset of the entire movie, and I'm going to say it mm-hmm. so that everyone can be prepared for it if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, Channing Tatum is barely in this fucking. Yeah, movie. it's a bummer. I mean, that he, pissed me off yeah. so much. Yeah, he and because I was like waiting for like him to be like the eggsy of you know yeah. the of the statesman. Um, yeah, I mean, like you know. It's doing well money wise, and hopefully they make that third movie because yeah. oh. you know who Matthew Vaughn wants as the villain? Whom? The Rock. Oh. I was like, come on, dude. Oh. come on, oh. come on. Um, and you know, p- you know, potentially making a statesman movie, and yeah. you know, focusing more on that. Yeah. Um, and the the little tease of crossovering. Yeah, uh, between the the, become, the two companies, they go from being like the cousins of you know yeah. they they say to the brothers to the brothers. Uh, you know, and yeah, you know, it's just yeah. it's I. I will say, uh, rewatching the, the the first one and then uh, watching the second one, I did love that like the bad guys. So for like, there's a there's a trend mm-hmm. with the bad guys in that their motivation is uh, I'm not gonna say like sound or anything yeah. like that, but like they have like they have like a a, a, a cause that is very popular. Uh, like like Sam Jackson, his whole thing. 
the roots of his of his uh, uh, plan was he's worried about global warming and mm-hmm. climate change and all yeah. that stuff, uh, and that's a very big thing now. A lot of people are trying to mm-hmm. do stuff to to counteract climate change, mm-hmm. uh, and then Julianne Moore, uh, she is uh, her thing is trying to um, legalize drugs. Mm-hmm. She's going a little bit extreme because she's like, I want all drugs legalized and uh, and um, uh, um, controlled. And uh, what, what's the word that she used? Um, regulated. Reg- yeah, yeah, regulated. Uh, and stuff like that. And, and like that's a very popular thing, too. Now, like, you know, a lot of people are trying to get marijuana uh, legalized. You know, play, places like Colorado, sure. Washington, it's totally legalized. Uh, a lot of other states, it's being decriminalized. Um, you can buy seeds in D.C., mm-hmm. Um and stuff like that. But their thing is, right, like they, no, you can't buy seeds. You can buy stuff and then get seeds as a free gift because you can't sell them, but you can possess them. Interesting. Uh, yeah. But right. they always go to the extreme. Yes, and but yeah. So they, she's like, she's like, in order to do it, I'm going to cause a plague. Yeah, everyone who's used <laughs> a drug is going to die. Yeah, a horrible death. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. And yeah, so you know it goes to to extremes and and insanity. Um, but I I can't wait to see what the rocks. Uh, I hope cause that's true, is. man. Like I said, you know, I, I hope it's like you know, I don't know, uh, saving kids with pediatric cancer or something like that. And he, in order to do it, he has to kill the population of adults in the world so that kids are the only people left. I don't know. It'll be it'll be something. It's, it's always it's always like I have this great grand like mm-hmm. you know thing that I'm working towards, and the only way to make that happen is to kill. 90% of the people on the planet. Yeah. And then start over. It's like Moonraker. Yeah. But uh Noah's Ark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he, maybe may, uh maybe he uh you know causes a great flood. Maybe it'll do something with like steroids. Yeah. <laughs> everyone gets everyone becomes, everyone everyone gets, becomes jacked. Not only, not only not only are steroids legal, but steroids are mandatory. Yeah. Bum, Mand- bum, bum. Mandatory. <laughs> Hold steroids. on. No, no. That would that would be if that would be if um if um Vince McMahon no. was the villain. Yeah, yeah, he could be. Who knows? Got him. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I enjoy it. I, I, you know, it's it's um, it's a hell of a good time. Yeah, L- wonderful special effects in it. Uh, There's just a like great the first shot one. of Eggsy trying to escape three people after like the car chase kind of restarts, mm-hmm. where he power slides through like London traffic. Yeah, and he just like is perfect. You, you know, it's it's just this really, oh, really cool overhead shot. Yes. Of just yeah, him like sliding a Grand Theft Auto yeah, yeah. one shot. Yeah, Grand Theft. You know, yeah, just sliding through, power sliding through. Yeah. Um, lots of, I feel like lots of obviously James Bond references. Definitely yes. like Roger Moore era stuff. And yeah, and and my fa- James Bond. You know, like just mm-hmm. like the campy, gadget heavy. Yeah. You know, James Bond. And I, and it's type a, of it's, thing. it's you know it's still uh, it's always going to be sad that Roger, Sir Roger Moore is gone, but he would have been so great in one of these movies. Oh, I feel like that would have been just been the he would have been a great villain. He'd be a great villain or a, or great, a great new Arthur, like yeah. Kingsman. But like you know, bringing in like the head of like an honorable head yeah. of Kingsman. Um, maybe maybe Sean Connery can le- come back out of retirement and be, be the new Arthur. Yeah, let's start getting, let's start casting some Bonds in these movies. Yeah, come on, Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton, T Dal baby. Yeah, T Dalt. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> give me give me some. Uh, um, why why am I blanking on his name? The one the one George Lazenby. Yeah, George Lazenby. Give him something to yeah, do yeah, sure. in his giant Jesus beard and everything. Yeah. Does he still have that? No. no. <laughs> well, tell him to put it back on. Yeah. <laughs> you want this job, don't you, yeah. Georgie? Grow it right now. Yeah. You'll float too. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. I went to Baltimore Comic Con. How was that? Oh, yeah. I moderated a panel. Was how was pretty... how was that? It was fine. <laughs> we entertained. Yeah. Yeah, it was the problem. Is it was at the very end of the day, uh, and they didn't promote it. I, you know, I, I the only promotion I saw for it was from you. Yeah, yeah. So then again, I'm not terribly Baltimore Comic Con prone, so I probably mm. don't have the uh, the advertising coming at me anyway. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, but nice. the, but it was I, a fun panel. It was yeah. fun. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Image, for letting me do it. Baby steps before you're the next Chris Hardwick and moderating yeah. like the Justice League. The, mi- two the Misfits panel. used to play in front of like ten people. And now they're reunited, and it feels so good. <laughs> Kiss, Kiss used to play for like ten, you know, ten people audiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, without yeah. face paint. Yeah, yeah. 
I did not have face paint. Yeah, well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's my gimmick. Yeah, yeah. but no, it's a, I I was like the Baltimore show. No, I I I went on Sunday. I hate about the Baltimore show. Hmm. Fucking parking. Mm. Ah, I was about to yeah. say Baltimore. Uh, yeah, remember we drove we we parked by like that like <laughs> rusty anchor place. Yeah, that was like across the way. Yeah, cr- on the other side of the harbor. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a bad sex move. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It wasn't great. Yeah. But I, like, again, the parking is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Well, thanks again to Steve for, for coming on the show. Again, you know, Maestro's out in comic book stores everywhere mm-hmm. on Wednesday, October 18th. Uh, this has been another uh, installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Chris. I'm Jake. Fried chicken. Thank you very much. Good night, Eric Bada. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual Catching Up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.